Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful that you are in our midst, that wherever we are, because we are gathered this way or in person in different locales, your presence is with us. And Lord, we ask that as we open your word now and as we consider what your spirit has placed upon my heart, that that would open up each of our hearts to be able to experience Jesus afresh. In your name we pray, amen. The engines fired up on either side of the massive body of the aircraft with a thunderous rumbling, feeling like an earthquake that, that seemed to rattle the bones of anyone nearby. The airship was loaded with supplies and, and readied for the mission, and everyone aboard was excited, anticipating a successful adventure. The engines rev to a deafening RPM, and the airship rose slowly at first, then more quickly as it gained altitude. The details on the ground gave way to landscape patterns of patchwork fields, orchards, hills. Before long, countryside gave way to suburban communities of houses and busy roadways with commuters. City high-rises surrounded by webs of pedestrian and jam traffic then came came into view, people like ants scurrying about, unaware of the mission overhead. And then the operation leader's command, open the hatch. And the large cargo door ramp at the rear of the airship opened with a blast of cold air and wind filling the inside of the cargo bay. Everyone rushed around, loosening the straps that had been securing the huge containers that held the precious cargo prepared for delivery. And once this was done, everyone stood aside as the floor that they were on began to rise on hydraulics. The containers slid down the ramp through the opening and these huge containers plummeted toward the ground. Large, colorful parachutes opened, and as they did, it opened the containers in such a way that many thousands of leaflets were released from each payload. What an exhilarating sight it was to behold. The sky was filled with gracefully floating white leaflets, gently pirouetting to the people below. People stopped when they were, where they were walking and, and where they were driving, and, and they looked to the sky to behold this incredible spectacle. Their, their faces were filled with wonder and bewilderment as the leaflets fell within reach. People reached out and they grabbed them and grasped them. And curiously, they began to scan the leaflets. Every leaflet had the same message on it. It's all about Jesus. Some people smiled and knowingly nodded. Some looked confused. Some shook their head with furrowed brow. Some stuffed the leaflet into a pocket or a bag. Some crumpled it and threw it to the ground. Some ignored it all as if nothing unusual was even happening around them. But for everyone, the meaning on that leaflet was without context. It, it literally was just an idea that fell from the sky. What did it mean? Who was this Jesus anyway? What did it matter? Why did they receive this message? How did it fit into their lives? Meanwhile, high above the masses, those on the airship cheered and they high-fived each other before buckling back into their seats for the flight back to their secure hom homogeneous communities. And they felt a sense of pride and accomplishment in sharing Jesus with others. This is the revised Dan version of an old black and white witnessing video that employed sarcasm uh, along the same lines entitled the gospel blimp. Now, of course, this parable is full of sarcasm. It, it would be difficult to draw any legitimate comparison between the modality of sharing Jesus employed in this parable with those that were modeled in the scriptures themselves. Jesus ministry was an incarnational mission. This was forecasted in one of the names that, that he would be called. Way back in the time of the prophet Isaiah, uh, he wrote in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
This prophecy in Isaiah was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, in the angel's announcement of Jesus' pending birth when the heavenly herald proclaimed, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus, the very Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, was the incarnation of God, the bodily, personal manifestation of God come to be with humans. Jesus grew in the womb of a woman, was birthed in a stable, delivered by his foster uh, father, worshipped by shepherds and foreign dignitaries, raised uh, in, a, in a village, mingling with ordinary people, living ordinary lives, working with his foster dad in the family carpentry shop. God's ultimate mission of sharing Jesus and his message with man was not some divine stone tablet or papyrus dropped from the sky. It was God's son himself being present with humans. God becoming human. This is a, a shocking, inconceivable development. It's just not what a being as lofty and otherly as the eternal divine creator does to become one with his own mere creations. And yet it's precisely what he does. And this is what is most difficult for the religious leaders of Jesus' day to accept about Jesus. I mean, from their confusion and denial of his incarnational identity flows their accusations of blasphemy, which means a person doing the unthinkable of, of claiming to be God. Only it was true. Jesus is God. And yet he grows up among, lives with, eats amidst, walks alongside fellow humans. And so it makes sense that sharing Jesus is not merely a matter of sharing about Jesus, though there, there is much to share about Jesus. In fact, so much could be shared about Jesus that the Gospel of John chapter 21, verse 25 says, the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Sharing Jesus is more than information about Jesus and his plan. Though such information is incredibly crucial and, and it needs to be shared. But, but sharing Jesus is more. There's a mystery, a, a secret to effectively sharing Jesus. And we find this in the Apostle Paul's letter to Jesus' faithful believers in the city of Colossae. Paul begins the letter by telling them how much he appreciates them and praises God in his prayers for them. And then notice what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. For God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Amen? This message, he continues, was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. And finally, verse 27, this is the key verse. For God wanted them to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles. In other words, you people who didn't know God ahead of time, it's for you too. And this is what he then says. And this is the secret. The secret. Here it is. Ready for it? Christ lives in you. And finally, he concludes, this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Wow. The believers in Colossae were sharing Jesus by teaching and living for Jesus. In fact, it goes a step further. The person of Jesus Christ, according to Paul, was alive and present in them through his Holy Spirit. What exactly does this look like? What does it mean? Recently, I was visiting with my son-in-law, Frank, who is married to my eldest daughter. And in my 2017 camp meeting message, I shared the story of how Frank came from a non-practicing Catholic family background. He was not actively religious and had little knowledge of God's word or of Jesus for that matter. 
I shared how, as he says, God just kicked down the door, quote, of his heart and came rushing into his life. I mean, it, it wasn't really a forced entry, he shares. It was just that he didn't really know how to unlock the door of his heart for God. But God knew that he was ready for him. After giving Frank and Andrew's study Bible and studying together uh, through Ty Gibson's TruthLink Bible study guides, a few weeks after that camp meeting sermon, I had the wonderful privilege of baptizing Frank, who would soon become my son-in-law. And I've witnessed the amazing transformation that Jesus has brought to Frank's life. Frank loves God's Word. He has read the Bible and religious books voraciously. He, he even began to self-learn biblical Greek. He shares Jesus with others and even his parents and his family via technology from long distance. So the other day, he said to me, you know what made the biggest impact in opening me up to Jesus? And I responded, well, tell me about it. And he shared that it wasn't so much what we said about Jesus in our family or what we read together from his word when we studied. It, was, it wasn't even our prayers that he heard us pray as a family. It was that he actually experienced Jesus in us. That's the secret that Paul shared in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, when Paul said, and this is the secret. Christ lives in you. As Paul referenced in his prayers of thanksgiving for the Colossian followers of Jesus, their lives were being transformed by the indwelling presence and power of Jesus in their lives. Paul concluded this opening chapter in verse 29 saying that it's Christ's mighty power that works within me. When we say it's all about Jesus, I mean, we mean it because Jesus meant it. All the disciples meant it. Paul meant it. And Frank meant it. It's important to study God's word, to learn about Jesus and his plan for your life. It, it's crucial to pray and, and talk to him continually. It's important to listen to his promptings and act on them accordingly. It's, it's crucial to live a life of surrender to Jesus and his direction. But make no mistake about it. As we do all of these things, it isn't those things that heal our brokenness and empowers us to live differently. It is the actual living presence and power of the person of Jesus in our life that transforms our lives. Jesus, not his message, is the healer. Jesus, not our spiritual practices, is the transforming power. Jesus himself, not our modalities of sharing, is the one who brings others to decision. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw everyone to myself. John 12, verse 32. So many times in my life, people have verbalized this truth back to me. It's been a humbling thing to hear them say this, but they've, they've said stuff like, I heard Jesus' voice when you were talking. I saw Jesus in what you did. I sensed Jesus' presence in you. It was like I saw a Jesus lighting up your face as you shared him with me. I felt Jesus touch my heart through you. I know Jesus met my needs through you. Powerful things, people have said. I've been in a public space just going about a normal task, and, and someone will say, are you a Christian? And I've responded, yes. What causes you to ask that question? And they say, well, I could just tell that there was something good about you. I try to remember to respond, that's, that's Jesus' presence with me. Over and over and over again, I've witnessed this through the years. And that's when I've seen God's word spring to life in other people's hearts. And, and that's when I've seen their wall of resistance melt away. That's when I've noticed real transformation happen in people's lives. That's when I've realized that I got beyond sharing stuff about Jesus to sharing Jesus himself 
simply because he's dwelling in me through his Holy Spirit. I don't really understand it. I have to that, admit that. It, it's hard to explain, but I know it by faith and I know it by experience. This sharing Jesus happens not because we have some special way to transfer the Jesus in us to others around us. It happens because we personally know and love and serve Jesus in our everyday lives and everyday interactions with others. And in doing so, Jesus' indwelling presence, it just moves from us to them and draws them to him. And they realize that they desire him in their lives as well. The incarnational God can only be shared incarnationally, friends. Incarnational sharing doesn't work as flyover evangelism like I was talking about at the beginning. Incarnational sharing doesn't work when we try to zip in and zip out of people's life to tell them some information and then pull back to our comfortable religious bubbles. Incarnational sharing happens when we are with others, doing life in their midst, when, when they can experience the presence of Christ in us. And this is why Jesus told his disciples that he had to leave and he had to return to heaven so that he could send his Holy Spirit to fill each of his followers' lives with his presence because that would enable him to do more through them in more places and touch more lives than he could in his bodily presence on earth. That's why he said, you will do even more than me, because Jesus could only be in one place at a time, but when he sent his spirit, his spirit bringing his presence and power into his followers' lives could help more people encounter him through his presence in them. This especially happens when followers of Jesus gather together. Any size gathering, really, from a couple of people to hundreds or thousands of people because Jesus promised in Matthew 18, 20, as you know that promise very well, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am, what? In the midst of them. Because as the Bible says, Christ is in you and Christ is in me. When we are together, his presence in me and his presence in you results in his presence being in our midst together. This is the significance of being engaged in, in small groups with fellow believers and inviting others to join us. When other people who aren't yet Jesus followers experience that, we are sharing Jesus with them. And Jesus begins to work his way into their lives. And they begin to want to know him more and, and better. Because they encounter him in you, they want what you have in them. The last church I pastored full time was a church based on small groups. And they did life together. The groups did life together, growing in mutual spiritual discipleship, actively doing acts of kindness, serving others and our community and sharing Jesus with others. We would do a lot of things that we invited other people outside of our church to participate in. And a lot of traditional believers might not think that we were doing church stuff, but just let me share with you how that went. We did what we called parties in the park. Jesus attended a lot of parties. Uh, we would go to different community parks to do kids fun days for the neighborhood and leading games, having puppet stories, uh, serving a free picnic food, having a bouncy house, one of those blow up bouncy houses they could bounce around in, having small fair booth type games and giving them a story booklet with Bible or moral stories for Jesus. Now, the truth is none of that stuff was really the point. The point was that people would spend several hours with us and before long they would begin to ask, what's different about you people? I can tell something's different. You have a joy and a friendliness and, and a generosity that isn't normal. And we would say, oh, that's Jesus in us. That's what he's like and, and he just shines out. And they would say, I can tell. Our groups would do 
A social gathering for anything and everything from birthdays to anniversaries to Mother's Day or Father's Day uh, parties or events or activities. Anything we could do to spend time together and invite our irreligious friends and guests and families to join. After all, who doesn't like a party? And so they came. Sound a little like Jesus in the Gospels? Within a short time, they would begin to ask the same kind of questions. Many times I would hear someone actually say, you're, you're part of a church, right? Yep, someone would respond. So here's a question that's been kind of going around in my mind. Uh, you people all seem to really like each other. I thought church people didn't like each other and didn't get along. <laughs> Ouch. Someone would respond, well, because we're family and Jesus is with us and he likes and loves everyone, so do we. I need that, they would say. And it would launch a new journey for them being discipled and discovering Jesus and learning to follow him. We had groups who loved to do weekend camping excursions together. The rule was every member who went had to invite a guest to come along. And as those guests hung out with us, saw our interactions with each other, and, and the love and the respect that we had for one another, the fun that we had with each other, they, the, the way that we played together, the way we mutually served each other, the passion with which we sang campfire songs or prayed, or the things members happened to just share from their heart, naturally, these guests experienced Christ in us. Without being overtly religious, we were sharing Jesus, the person and presence and power of Jesus. After a whole weekend with us, guests were asking questions about knowing Jesus better, joining us for other activities or doing some service activity with us in the community that we had talked about, beginning to attend church services. And this led to a deeper desire for knowing Jesus and his plan for them through Bible studies and seminars and retreats and Sabbath morning classes and special events and worship services. Always people could experience Jesus. Every spring and fall, we had a public harvest week where we would share the Adventist beliefs that Ellen White called the pillars of Adventism in about 10 to 14 messages in a series. In each meeting, we would invite those people who'd been journeying with us to make a decision to become a Seventh-day Adventist follower of Jesus, which many already had been experiencing before they made the decision. And so most made that decision. The baptismal celebrations, oh, I'll never forget them. They were a, a Sabbath afternoon affair with passionate worship, a brief message on the meaning of baptism for all the friends and family guests who had come who were invited so that they would understand what they were witnessing. And we'd have a reception with balloons and gifts and food and families and fellowship. Another opportunity for others to experience the Jesus whose presence is in each of us as his follower. And even more of those guests would be drawn to Jesus as they would experience him in our lives as they celebrated with us. That church grew from 16 to hundreds. Most of those people had not been engaged with church before. A majority became first-time followers of Jesus and Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And a radically diverse group of different backgrounds socially, politically, economically, racially, religiously, yet drawn together in true unity through sharing the presence and the power of Jesus in our midst. All because Jesus is the most beautiful and attractive person that anyone will ever meet. From him flows unlimited love and care and healing and wholeness and joy. People are longing to meet this Jesus even if they don't know it. We who are Jesus' followers in whom his presence is dwelling just need to keep fostering our relationship with Jesus and then live our lives alongside others, invite them to spend time doing real stuff together, and then let them experience his presence through us. And many will be drawn to knowing, loving, and serving him. And then they too will be sharing Jesus. Friends, 
This is not complex. It doesn't require, it does, however, require commitment. Let's Com back. Yeah. Let's just back up Friends, this is not complex. This, yeah. is, this is a powerful moment. Let's not stumble. Let's okay. Go. Ready? I am. Two, one. Friends, this is not complex. It does, however, require commitment to Jesus and to others. But when you are knowing, loving, and serving Jesus and others, then you will automatically be sharing Jesus with others. That's the not-so-secret secret that Paul refers to and that Jesus calls us to. What do you say? Are you willing to do life with Jesus together with others? As we launch out of the difficult past year that separated people and at all levels of their lives, this is a time that calls for connecting intentionally in each home, in each neighborhood, in each church, in each school, in each ministry, across this whole Oregon Conference territory. And as we do this, we will see Jesus in us begin to do more than we ever dreamed he would do through us. Many thousands will be drawn to Jesus and become his followers with us, experiencing his transformational presence and power in their lives. Brothers and sisters, this is the secret to sharing Jesus. Let's let Jesus' light in us spread from one to another to another until it touches a multitude of people who experience us sharing Jesus with them. There is a candle in every soul, some brightly burning, some dark and cold. There is a spirit who brings the fire, ignites a candle, and makes his home. Frustrated brother, see how he tried to light his own candle some other way. See now your sister, she's been robbed and lied to, still holds a candle without a flame.
What a powerful and beautiful song talking about this very thing we've been exploring together. Let's bow our heads in prayer and I invite you just to get in touch with the Jesus who is in you because he promised he would be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've done the unthinkable and that when your son Jesus went back to heaven from earth, he sent his promised Holy Spirit to dwell within his followers and bring the very presence of Jesus into our lives. Lord, we pray that we will simply live our lives intentionally with other people so they can experience Jesus in us so that we are naturally and intentionally sharing Jesus with others. It's our prayer, Lord, not for any glory of our own, but for your glory alone. Amen.